and welcome to a very special midday live recipe. So every day I'm doing these recipes from home um, because you know we're not able to teach in school at the moment. So um, a lot of you will have joined me already. Um, if you haven't joined me before, welcome. Please do ask questions as we go along. That's the beauty of a live is that you guys can ask me questions as we cook together because I know what it's like when you watch a cooking show and you you're listening to it but then you don't quite catch something and you're like oh what did he say this is this that I didn't get that bit what is that ingredient can I substitute that ingredient with something else like we all have those questions when we watch cooking shows so the beauty of a live recipe is that you guys can actually ask those questions to me in real time you can also watch them back you can ask me questions afterwards as well so let's get the live up here so the deal is that you guys I throw loads of questions at me, preferably food questions, I don't know about anything else, so make it about vegan food, please. Um, and I will be able to read your comments and questions here. So you can say a quick hello to me, you can tell me where you're from, we're getting loads of people from all around the world. Um, we had a great question from someone yesterday who is from America, um, and they, they don't have mom like that, they don't have mom like that, so they asked for a substitution, so I came up with that information for them, so please do ask questions. Before we get going, Carly, welcome, 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 you're looking forward to this one, so am I. This is a very special one. It's a very secret one. This is actually a secret birthday cake for my boyfriend who's upstairs. So shh. I know I've had to like make this whole thing in secret, which is a task in itself. If any of you guys have birthdays that you're having to do whilst in lockdown, then I can give you my tips on how to make a birthday cake without them noticing. So far he hasn't tweaked. So, Don, good morning from Rochester, New York. Good morning, Ariel. Thank you for joining us again. Um, so, before we get started, there is a rainbow somewhere here today. There will always be a rainbow in shot in one of the, in, in our recipe videos. Always, always, always. So, um, please do let me know when you find the rainbow. Um, and we have just shared with you guys um, the, uh, the, the recipe um, in text form. So, you know, you can always have a look at that and follow along if you want to. Um, some people can find it quite hard to, to see our ingredients list here. So, you know, that's there for you if you need it. Um, uh, but we will take photos of this and share it afterwards as well. Um, but, you know, it just makes it a bit easier for you guys. So, Simone, I just need to get tapioca. Okay, so there is a substitution for tapioca and I've actually put that in our list here and it's in the ingredients list that you've got in the comments. So you can use potato starch instead of tapioca. We'll get more into that as we go through the recipe. And Karen joined us again. Thank you for joining us. It's lovely when people come back and we get to know you a little bit as well. Um, so on to today's recipe. So today's recipe is a moist chocolate fudge cake. It is gluten free. I know not all of you are gluten free, um, but you know it's a great thing to be able to make something like this and gluten free. Not necessarily for yourself, but you know for friends or whatever. But I know a lot of people now who have become so much more comfortable with gluten free cooking. They actually make it for themselves, even though they're not gluten free. They find it lighter. You know, so the food doesn't sit so heavy. Um, and so you know when they can, they try out these gluten free recipes. And so we'll give you a substitution for um, the gluten version of, of, the, of the cake today. Okay, so let's start with our cake, um, our cake tin. So this is our spring form cake tin. I am going to cover the base because that just means that the cake will come out a lot easier. And this is a technique that I learned in my first job as a pastry chef. So I'm going to take our reusable baking sheet here and I'm going to cover the bottom. We're just going to cover the bottom. We don't need to cover the sides because the sides is fairly easy to get it away from the sides. Um, but this just really, really helps us get it out. And what that means as well is that if you want it to cool down a bit quicker, which I never to be do, always in a rush when I'm cooking, always, um, then you're going to be able to cool it down quicker as well. So this is a bit of a kind of 
you know, it's a physical technique that you have to get used to, but you know, you squish it down with all of those sides underneath, and then there we go. And it is a bit stiff, but that's good because um, because we don't want the cake to seep out the bottom, basically, and this is going to be quite a runny cake. So we did have a quick hello from a lady in India. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name. Um, you can just say hello again. Say hello again. That would be nice. Uh, Virginia, hello from Cork. Thank you for joining me again. And Reshma, thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed today's recipe as much as I do. So this is a really, really lovely recipe. Um, I'm just going to make that a bit straighter. There we go. So it's nice and packed in. Uh, you know, there's all that like stuff on the bottom, but that can be packed down nicely and it's going to sit very well in the oven. So with our cake base today, you know, I have um, the ingredients up there for the cake base. That is just for one of these. So if you want to make two, then just do it twice. But, you know, in a lot of recipes, you will see um, they'll put twice the amount of the ingredients on there. But I don't think that's necessarily like a good idea because in my experience, most people have only got one of these. And if you make up the batter, you pour half of this in and cook it. And then once it's all done, take it out and then do the, the next one. Well, that's not going to be a great idea because you've got raising agents in there. And as soon as raising agents get wet, they're going to start reacting. So what will happen is the second layer that you make will be a different consistency to the first layer. And we don't want that. So I always say do them one at a time. So do the whole, sorry, do the, um, the one layer recipe, bake that, let it rest and then do the next recipe, do the next layer recipe and then cook that rather than making two lots of these ingredients and then splitting it in two. I don't recommend that at all. So, ah, Talisa and Teddy, you're here. Hello, hello, have you, you can, you can find out where the rainbow is because I know Teddy is an expert rainbow finder. That should be a job, that would be an amazing job. <laughs> That would be such, oh, right, okay, I'm not going to be a chef anymore, I'm just going to be an expert rainbow finder. Robbie, thank you for joining me as always. And Isabel, welcome, welcome, welcome. So, just to catch you guys up, we're making chocolate fudge cake today. It's a secret for him upstairs. Not God, my boyfriend who's upstairs. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, right, okay, so uh, we are just going to make one layer at a time. With this recipe, quite often, um, with recipes that I demonstrate, I'll pour out, uh, I'll measure out, you know, the bits and pieces that I need into these lovely little, little pots here, these lovely little colourful pots, love them. But I wanted to show you guys a really, really easy method because, you know, if you spend time getting all of your bits and pieces weighed out and measured out, it can be quite a laborious task. So, with this cake recipe, we're going to make it on our scales. So, this is the scales that I use. Um, and we're just simply going to put the bowl on there. And then I'm going to hit zero whenever I need to um, go back to zero um, and put a new ingredient in. And so, this is why you'll see that the oil and the milk are measured in grams rather than millilitres because we're just going to do it in a one bowl method. How great is that? Because it basically means less washing up. Who's up for less washing up? I know I am. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Shay, thank you for joining me. Okay, so we're going to start with our chickpea flour uh, or gram flour. So it's also known as besan flour too. So we need 100 grams of that. Nearly, almost. There we go. That's a hundred. Joanne says hello from Lanzarote. I think you may have joined us yesterday as well. Was it the day before? I remember someone from Lanzarote coming along. Because I was jealous. I was jealous. Not that Horsham isn't nice. Horsham's lovely. Okay, and then uh, our tapioca flour. So the reason why we are combining these flours is because a light powdery flour like this goes together really, really well with a heavier flour, like gram flour. And it just kind of balances it out, basically. And this is my go-to combination. 
So either tapioca flour or, as I said, potato starch. So tapioca flour you can often get in America. Um, so Tor said hello and yum. Hmm. You wait and see. It's going to be good. It's going to be good, this one. So yes, in America, quite often you can get tapioca flour. In the UK, you can find potato starch. Um, even some supermarkets sell it. So, but if you're looking for this kind of like powdery white, fluffy flour that's going to balance out that heavier, that heavier chickpea flour. Okay, so on to the next ingredient. Um, oh, sorry, and just to say, if you aren't gluten free and you don't really care about making it gluten free, then just substitute those two flours with a total of 150 grams of plain flour. That's all you need to do. Simple, simple, simple. So, with all of the recipes that I make, they are gluten free because I'm gluten free. But I will um, give you the, uh, the gluten containing substitute for that which is fairly easy to do. It's much easier to do it that way than it is the other way around. So um, our next ingredient will be our cocoa powder. So we'll just grab some cocoa powder. So we've got raw cacao here. You can just use cocoa powder if you want. I love raw cacao, I'm kind of addicted to it, to be honest. Um, and we just need 30 grams of that. So I get my nice long spoon. This is really, really helpful, you know, having a long spoon like this, because if you have a shorter spoon, then inevitably what happens is your hand ends up in the packet and it gets all cocoa-y. Cocoa -y. <laughs> That's a word, right? Is now. Um, okay, and next is our coconut sugar. So a lot of these ingredients are things that I've bought from Amazon. Um, I tend to buy the really big packets because it saves money. And what it means is that you can generally, because you're saving money, you can then afford to buy the organic stuff. Hi from Australia. Ooh, very far away. I wonder if you're the furthest person away that we've had. Uh, maybe further would be New Zealand. So any New Zealanders out there? Uh, Sue, could you use coconut flour? Yes, absolutely. You just gotta be mindful of the fact that it will taste of coconut of course, but if you're okay with that, then fine. Neil, hi from the New Forest. Ah, oh, I haven't actually been there, but I would absolutely love to. So 100 grams of coconut sugar. You can use whatever sugar you want, whatever sugar you feel comfortable with. It's really, really up to you. So 100 grams. And I'm going carefully because it's really annoying if you put too much in and then you're trying to fish it out. And inevitably, you can't just fish out the ingredient that you just put in there. You end up fishing out some of the other ingredients too. So we don't want to do that. So we're just being very, very careful with this. There we go. 100 grams of that. Ariel, can I use dove gluten-free flour along with a gram flour instead of tapioca or potato starch, or is it too heavy? So, actually, um, the dove's gluten-free flour is quite light and powdery because it does have quite a lot of, I think, rice flour in it and potato flour. So it was probably quite a good substitute for this. So yes, I think it would be it would be okay. I do find it a bit too on the light side. So if I'm gonna use something by does, then I would usually use their bread flour, which has a lot more body. Their plain flour seems to be quite powdery, but I would mix it with the ground flour and then I think that you'll be okay. Could you use less sugar? Yes, absolutely. But you just have to be mindful of the fact that in this recipe, we've put a lot of cocoa, which can be bitter. So you need the sugar to balance it out. But yes, of course you can. And you know, I use coconut sugar because I I think it's healthier than uh, the refined sugars. But you know, it's completely up to you. You can also use things like xylitol. You know, if you're comfortable using things like that. Um, hi from Texas, USA. Cool. <laughs> Um, so, onto the next ingredients. Actually, I'm just going to give that a quick mix, and you'll see that I'm using my whisk. Is it actually? It's not just a whisk. It's a whisk attachment. Um, that's what it is. And I love using a whisk attachment rather than specifically getting a whisk because you just don't need one. And the more I can limit the um, the equipment that's in my already busy kitchen, the better. So Ariel said, "Thank you." No problem. So we're going to add to that half a teaspoon of baking powder, half a teaspoon of, sorry, there we go, 
that's the baking powder, and half a teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda. Okay, and then that can go in. Okay, so give it another whisk. And the whisk really breaks up any of those um, little kind of bits of flour or anything like that that are clumping together. It does a really, really good job of that. Could you use corn flour instead? So it depends on what type of corn flour. If it's the corn flour that we use for things like um, uh, you know, gravy, that type of very, very thin corn flour, maybe not because it's, it's a bit too starchy and it's a bit too gummy. So I wouldn't recommend that. There are other types of um, of corn flour that you can get that aren't as fine and powdery. I believe that in the States there, there's a few different types of corn flour um, that mainly come from South America, where you know that, that's quite a common ingredient. There are different types of it as well. Okay, so now we're gonna add our liquid ingredients. We've got milk here. You can use whatever dairy-free milk you want. And we've also got some oil. So with the oil, it needs to be some sort of neutral oil. So I'm just using a sunflower oil. So Maxine said hi from Dublin. Didn't we have somebody else from Dublin earlier on? I think there might be a few of you in there. Um, so 75 grams of sunflower oil. Again, just being really careful with this, paying attention to those numbers. When you're doing a recipe like this, you don't want to be distracted. But that's quite nice because, you know, we just get to focus on this recipe for the present. You know, this is all we need to think about right now is just this recipe that we're making, which is a really, really lovely thing. And I've heard it said before that, that cooking um, can be a real great form of meditation. I think it was Michael Pollan that said that. If you guys know Michael Pollan, uh, he's, yeah, absolutely amazing. And he said uh, about um, cooking, you just need to stir the pot. You know, if you want to meditate, you just go and stir the pot and just concentrate on the pot. And it's exactly the same with this cake. All you need to focus on is the chocolate fudge cake. There we go. Meditation 101 with cooking. Okay, so I'm just going to add about half the milk into here and then give it a mix. And the reason why I'm doing it this way is just to make sure that it doesn't get lumpy and you'll see that you know that's a method repeated in many recipes where you just add half the liquid mix it in with the flour usually get rid of any of the lumps and then we add the rest of it so we're going up to 225 here so you have to be particularly careful when you're adding these um, onto into a bowl that is on the scale because it can jump Quite quickly. Hi from Liverpool. And Adam, corn flour is way too starchy for cake. Yeah, exactly. Well, I would say the type of corn flour. Let me just see if I've got some. Yeah. Okay. This corn flour, yes, way too starchy. But as I mentioned before, there are other types of corn flour that you can get. Um, some of them have made their way over here. Um, so you can make things like corn tortillas with them and stuff like that, and that's a very different corn flour. Um, so it can get a little bit confusing when you start delving into corn flours. But I found some really good ones. There's a great one uh, made by an organic company in the UK called Infinity Foods. Great for making tortillas. Um, more similar to, I would say, rice flour. Um, so in that case, you could use that type of corn flour for a cake. Okay. So I guess, yeah, actually, uh, corn cakes. So if you think of that type of flour that's used for corn cakes, yeah, that, that would be okay. It's just that really fine powdery stuff. But again, I'd mix it, I'd mix it. So I wouldn't use it on its own, I'd use it with something else. Right, okay, so you can see, hopefully, that this is really, really liquidy. And this is, this, this high moisture content is basically what means that the, um, the cake is moist. But of course, it means that the cake tin needs to be really, really, really well sealed. And I know some of you will have cake tins that are a bit old, they're a bit, you know, maybe this, this thing doesn't work so well anymore, it isn't that tight. So you need one that is really, really tight. 
and you know, none of that fatter is going to come out. So we can just pour the batter into that. See, very, very, very liquidy. Like a milkshake, a chocolate milkshake. Oh, that would make a lovely chocolate milkshake. Yum. Okay, so now with the baking of it, um, you shouldn't put this just on one heat. You're going to need to change the heat. So first of all, for 15 minutes, you bake it at 200 degrees Celsius. And then you lower the heat to 180 degrees and cook it for another 40 minutes. Uh, Janet said, does it matter what oil you use, as in vegetable, corn, rapeseed, etc.? So a neutral oil. So give it a little taste, you know, you can just um, put a little dab onto your finger and then taste it and just, you know, is, is it, uh, does it have a strong flavour, does it not, you just want a really, really neutral oil. Britta, thank you for joining us. Um, Jenny, hi from High Peak. Where's High Peak? This sounds pretty cool. Okay, so we're going to pop that in the oven. And, of course, here's one I made earlier. So, this is, this is uh, the result of my secret cake baking. So when it first goes into the oven, just move these over to the side. When your cake goes into the oven and, you know, you're going to cook it at that high temperature, it will really spring up. There we go. It will really spring up and get some good height on it. Um, so it will look like this. And don't, don't worry if it looks like that and it breaks. That's going to happen. But what we can do now that we want to get to the point where we want to make it more of a pretty cake, um, we can just simply take the top off, which is what I've done here. And so, you know, if you've ever... Ooh, I don't have anywhere to put this. Where am I going to put it? Let me just get a plate. Um, there we go. Right, if you guys have ever seen those uh, you know, reality TV shows of cake bakers and they make these amazing towers and um, you know they all look like really perfect and uniform, it's because they do this. Now, do not fear, this will not go to waste. You can use it, I mean, just crumbled into ice cream is uh, really, really lovely. Um, chapel on the frith. Oh, I don't know what that was about. Um, you can even, um, you can even put it into a milkshake and blend it into a milkshake. Ah, oh, that would be really, really nice. You can freeze it as well. So, you know, if you don't want it now, because let's face it, you're going to have a cake to get your way through, to make your way through. You probably aren't going to necessarily need any any dessert type things but just pop it in the freezer and it will defrost really really well and then you can make up your own emergency desserts with it which we have another recipe video for amazing right okay so we'll just pop this to one side while we talk frosting very 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 important so sorry i had to i had to so we've got quite a few crumbs on here and we will get rid of those because when you're frosting something, you don't want crumbs around because, oh my gosh, they are so annoying. So annoying, they'll get into your frosting. So we want to try and get rid of those quick, smart. There we go. Let's just get rid of those. You are so sweet. As if we would ever waste scraps of cake. Just eat them. Absolutely. Mmm, they're the best bits. Because it's that kind of like cheeky bit that you just got then, you know, that you're not like really meant to have, but you just have it. And, oh, really nice. Okay, so we're going to make two different types of frosting, both really, really, really simple and easy. The reason why I want to do both is because, you know, to show you guys both, but also we're going to have quite rich, chocolatey peanut butter frosting around the outside. So I want something lighter for the inside. So... For the inside, we will be making a cream cheese frosting. So the ingredients that are here. Really, really, really simple because we have wonderful products like this now on the market, which is Vio Life. Um, so it's the Vio Life cream cheese. 
Please, if you are buying vegan cream cheese for this recipe, make sure that it is the plain one. It doesn't have any garlic or herbs in it. Easy mistake to make, but it's not gonna make for a nice tasting cake. So, um, we are just going to simply add 12 tablespoons. And I know that this is 12 tablespoons because I have measured it uh, myself, but basically it's a whole one of these and this is 200 grams. Um, I am probably making more than we need because you know, the cake isn't that big, but with this stuff, like it's much better to have too much than not enough. Um, and again, it's something that freezes really well. You can make emergency desserts with it, you know, that type of thing. So, and you know, I've made cakes before and I try to um, skimp, you know, and try to just make, you know, the right amount that I needed. And it's always like a pain when, when you don't have quite enough. <clears throat> so one thing to say is that when you make a cake and you're going to add frosting, you need to make sure that the sponge is completely, completely cool. So I actually started making this a couple of days ago um, so that, um, you know, I've only got one tin in my house at the moment uh, for these, so I had to do them in shifts and I wanted to leave them to, you know, cool down completely and then they even went into the fridge um, hidden in foil um, and then came out today so we could finish them off together. So in here we have four, <coughs> it's that bit of errant cake that I gobbled up, <coughs> that'll teach me. Uh, four tablespoons of powdered sugar or icing sugar. So this is the Billington's the brand that I really, really like. It's less refined than a lot of the other stuff. So four tablespoons of that. The other day I did talk to you guys about ratios. So you can see in the ingredients list here that we have 12 tablespoons of cream cheese and four tablespoons of icing sugar. So I've got a question for you guys. Can anybody tell me what that ratio is? Because once you start thinking about recipes in that way, it can be a really, really good way to um, become a better chef, basically, become a better home cook, like once you understand that. So we've got 12 tablespoons of cream cheese there and four tablespoons of icing sugar. What's the ratio? I bet you didn't think you were gonna learn about maths today. We've got everything, we've got art, we've got food, we've got maths, food, and more food. Um, okay, so <laughs> we're gonna add some vanilla essence here about a quarter of a teaspoon to half a teaspoon. It depends on how strong you want it. Um, I'm just doing it by eye, uh, but I've given you guys the measurements if you need them. So with vanilla essence or, you know, vanilla paste. So vanilla paste is, is the um, kind of like gummy, gummy stuff that has the seeds in it. I would only ever, three to one, Carly, you are my girl. Thank you. Three to one is the ratio that you need. Okay, so that means it will help you guys figure that out um, and just amend it to, to your needs, basically, and how much of this, of this frosting that you need. Okay, so we're just gonna mix that in. And as I was saying about vanilla essence and vanilla paste, vanilla paste is the more expensive stuff and it has the actual seeds in it. So only use that if people are gonna be able to see it. So if you want to make an ice cream or a cream that is going to go on the side of something, then yeah, go ahead and use the paste because when we see those seeds, we go, oh, vanilla. So there's that association in our head. And also we know that vanilla is really expensive. It's like more expensive than gold or something, maybe. Um, oh, Louise, Louise joined. Hello, hello. And you got it, three to one, well done. Um, yeah, so if you can see the vanilla, then use the vanilla paste or vanilla pods um, so that you've got those little speckles and they're really, really lovely. You know, you know that if somebody has made you a dessert and you can see those vanilla pods, they really splashed out. Okay, so we've just mixed all that in and let's now pop it onto this layer. So this is gonna be the layer that goes in the middle. This is nice and light, creamy. Um, it's a light sugariness. Whereas the peanut butter um, chocolate frosting is gonna be quite dark, um, quite rich. So it's good. These, these guys are gonna balance each other out. Sorry. I suggest sharing this Facebook Live. 
cooking demonstration so more can see it live. Mm. Well, we do share it on our page, and but if there are other places that you would like us to share it, then let us know. Um, we do have a bit of an issue with um, quite a few of the vegan groups, well actually any Facebook groups, don't really like the person that owns the page to be sharing it. But if you guys want to go and share it, then you know, please, please do. The more people that we get here and the more information that we can give people and, you know, just get people cooking as much as possible is wonderful. So I'm just going to plop this on and smooth it out. You don't have to worry about it too, too much. I'm going not too close to the edge because when I put the next layer on, when I put the next layer on, it's going to squash it down and I don't want it coming out the sides because if it comes out the sides, then when I put the next frosting on, the peanut butter one, they're probably going to interfere a bit with each other. Okay, so there is stuff left over. Um, you know, and you guys can get more creative with this, you know, and, and maybe, you know, mix up the, the frostings, you know, make a marble effect or something like that. Okay, and so we'll pop this layer on. And I'm actually gonna decide to, so this bit is, um, so this side is the one that I cut. I'm gonna put that down. And the reason why is that when we start frosting, if any of those bits uh, come up and go into the frosting, you know, there's little bits of cake, it's going to make the frosting look not very, not very nice. Um, and, you know, one other tip, and I know this from, from being a patisserie chef before, is that quite often when you're making a cake, especially when you're making a more, a more of an elaborate one than this, for about 90% of the time, it looks awful. And then it's just in the final 10%, it starts looking a hell of a lot better because you know it's all about aesthetics with, with something like this. Okay, uh, I meant for those watching to share on their own Facebook page. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yes, that would be that would be great. That would be really, really helpful to us. Um, as I said, you know, the more that we can get people coming along, get a nice community. We've also got a community page. So, sorry, a community group. Um, so recently we set up a Facebook group, which I know some of you guys are members of, um, and the uh, the group is just a really, really lovely way that we can share and communicate, and people are actually posting their pictures of the recipes that they've been making from me. So on to our peanut butter and chocolate frosting. <clears throat> if you guys are not drooling now, I'm doing my job wrong. <laughs> okay, so in here, basically, we have one cup of each of these three ingredients. So first of all, we've got our smooth peanut butter. Again, I'm probably um, making too much, but that's fine. That's fine. I'm, I'm not gonna mind having too much of this in my fridge. Really, really not, it's not gonna be at all. So one cup of peanut butter, one cup of syrup, and I've used date syrup because I really, really like it. But it, uh, because I've used date syrup, it's quite a dark, sugary flavour. It's not light like agave. So that means that you know, that's going to add to the richness, but the richness is what I want. But if you want it lighter, then use something like agave or rice syrup. And then add it to this one cup of raw cacao or cocoa powder. So I could ask you what the ratio is for that bit of the recipe, but that would be really easy. That would be far too easy. Okay, so we're just gonna mix this together. I do have my blender, my stick blender here, just in case, but let's see if we can get it going. First of all, I'm gonna use a fork because I know, you know what peanut butter's like. You know what peanut butter's like. So we're big fans of peanut butter in this house. Um, every morning for breakfast, I have peanut butter and rice cakes and our kitten, well he's not so much of a kitten anymore, actually he's just got to be an adult. Uh, this is our two year old cat. He comes and eats it with me. So he absolutely loves peanut butter. So we've got our little ritual in the morning. He comes and sits next to me and he has his peanut butter and I have my peanut butter. Okay, so just one thing to note, 
high sided bowl. If I hadn't used a high sided bowl, that cocoa, the cacao, would have gone everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. So I'm just using the back of this fork to really try and get it as smooth as possible. If you, you know, I think some people can find that a bit difficult because it is a bit tough. So if you are finding it a bit difficult, then just use, just use a blender. Just use a hand blender. Okay. There we go. So do you mix the PB in its oil first? Let me show you the PB that I get. butter that I use. Um, I get it in these massive um, tubs because if I got it in the smaller ones I would just be going through those like every couple of days. So I have to get it in these big tubs. Um, and you'll see what the oil separation is. Um, so when, so this hasn't separated that much but I know some of them can. So I would say mix it in first because you don't want just like the dry peanut butter going in there because that will really play around with um, the, the texture of it. Um, so I would say, yeah, mix it in. But this one, this one was okay. This one wasn't too bad, but sometimes like they can really, really separate. And I've heard of people before, actually, I haven't tried this myself, but of using the oil in cookies for the peanut butter, which sounds divine. Okay, so we've got our frosting here, and you know, the more that this mixes together, the more it's um, much more firm, much more firm. So it's the perfect, it's the perfect consistency for frosting. So let's get onto our frosting. I've got a, a good straight knife here that I'm going to use. Don't have a palette knife here, everything's at the school. So, you know, I'm kind of making do with the bits and pieces that I've got. But that's good because I figure that, you know, there'll be things that you guys have at home as well. If you uh, missed our recipe yesterday, we were making meringues and I used a recycled plastic bag that my organic raspberries had come in as a piping bag. You know, so it's great to use things like that and just see how we can, how can we reuse things that we've got around the kitchen. Okay. So please do, ah, oh, Simone, you're loving it. Good, 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 good. Um, so please do ask me some questions. Now, now's a really, really good time um, because I'm just gonna be putting this on. Oh my God, this is meditation. This is, this is definitely a form of meditation. Wow. It's very, very, very relaxing, which I think we all need at the moment, definitely. It's like one of those, you know, those little sand things that people used to have on their, on their desks. It's like one of those. It's brilliant. And then I'm going to get it to go down the side as well. And then we're going to decorate it. So I know that we have been asking you guys some questions, taking polls. So we're just trying to figure out, you know, what, what do you guys need from us? You know, what recipes do you need? What help um, do you need when it comes to vegan cooking? Um, what would you like to see us do? I mean, of course, you know, we've got these recipes, but we can also do other things as well. You know, we can talk about food geekery. Oh my God, I love talking about food geekery. Um, and really, really like delve into like one particular vegetable, you know, and how it's used in like different countries or something like that. We can do sessions on techniques as well, because you know, they're, I think it's really important to go off recipe because to be honest, you know, if you just want a recipe, you can just go and Google for a recipe. And there are so many out there, but we can give you something a bit different. Definitely. Did anybody find the rainbow today? Did I miss that bit? Slice of cake equals how many marathons? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think we might have to all become ultra, ultra athletes for this one. This one's fairly naughty, but you know, it's a special occasion. It is a special occasion. So, 
I'm just being super careful with going round the side and I'm adding quite a fair amount to there. So it's better the more you add to create this thick layer because if you get too close to the actual cake then bits of the cake will start coming off and they'll go into the frosting and we don't want that. No, 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 we don't want that. Okay, can you use cashew cream instead of cream cheese? Sue asks. Yes, you can. So the difference though will be that using cream cheese um, is very, very good at setting, um, whereas uh, whereas cashew cream isn't so good at that. I mean, it can get quite thick, particularly if you put it in the fridge. Cashew cream can thicken really, really, really well, uh, but it doesn't necessarily set. But you could you could get around that if it's something you know if it's just going into a cake like this. I don't think it really matters whether it's going to set or not uh, because it's going to be on the inside. If you want it to be on the outside and you do want it to set more, then. I would recommend that you add something like um, some melted coconut oil, preferably refined if you don't want that coconut flavour. Okay. So, any more questions? Ooh, day, that looks lovely. <laughs> The, the tikka masala recipe, yes, that is definitely, definitely on the list. Um, so last night I, I was doing a bit of a calendar for us so, so we know which recipes we're going to be doing and when. Um, a lot of what we've been doing, we've been doing on the fly because, you know, this um, our, our circumstances have somewhat taken us by surprise. So a lot of this has been done on the fly, but we're learning um, and I hope that with each recipe video, what we're offering you is is a better a better service. So so to say uh, for, uh, for today, I tried making all of these um, all of these uh, instructions and you know the ingredients list and stuff like that bigger for you guys because that was one thing that that people said was that they couldn't see it because I know some of you are watching on really tiny smartphones and you might not be able to see our ingredients list as we go. So I hope that you guys can see that today, um, and also I hope that you can hear me because you know we've had a couple of people saying saying that they can't hear me. So I'm trying to speak louder. Um, and so Virginia said sushi, sushi. Yes, definitely. I will definitely, definitely, definitely put that on the list. Love some sushi, and also you know sushi is a great versatile recipe. So that would be a good one to get you guys using up all of those back of the cupboard ingredients and I'll show you some good alternatives for sushi as well that will make it a bit more interesting for you guys I'm sure we won't just be doing avocado maki no 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 cucumber maki either no we'll make it a bit more interesting okay so once I have gone once I have uh, got it all the way around I'm just gonna use the plate and turn it as the knife stays in the same place right there we go and you'll see this has been such a good consistency for frosting it's nice and stable there is nothing worse than making a frosting and it's either too runny or too thick that just isn't great at all um, and it can be quite frustrating when when it's like that so I'm just gonna clean this up a little bit get the crumbs off so you can use something sound and picture quality oh, good. thank you thank you thank you for letting me know that it's very important so you can decorate this with lots of different things so chopped nuts um, toasted and chopped hazelnuts, lovely, lovely, lovely. Any nuts that you've got at home actually would be really lovely on this cake. Um, cacao nibs as well. So you know, if you if they're already like quite fairly ground, then you can just sprinkle them on top. Really great to add some texture to it. You can put things like edible flowers on there as well. But I just decided to keep it really, really simple today and use a bit of cacao. Yes, I know more cacao. And just, and just uh, sprinkle some on top. 
because I decided that basically I didn't want to add any other flavours into this, that it's nice as it is, and I really wanted it to be very peanutty um, and chocolatey, of course. And this is just really simple, but really, really effective. And we've got this lovely magical ingredient, and I must say it is magical because it's fairy dust. Uh, just answering a question from Danielle, if I want to replace the ground flour with an all-purpose flour, um, or is there another you would recommend, is it the same dose? So yes, absolutely. In our ingredients list, we've actually put the details for that as well. That's right at the very top. Um, you can substitute the gram flour and the tapioca flour for just like a plain flour, an all-purpose flour. So instead of using the 100 grams of gram flour and the 50 grams of tapioca flour, you use 150 grams of plain flour or, or all-purpose flour. Okay, so now for the fairy dust. And this is such a wonderful invention because, of course, we can sprinkle it on top. That's fine, that's fine, that's standard. But because it's a pump, we can also, I'm so excited about this, we can also spray it on the sides. And if any of you guys have tried to decorate the sides of a cake without it falling on the floor, you'll know it is really, really difficult. Okay, so there we go. That is our chocolate fudge cake recipe. We do have just a couple of additions. <clears throat> I'm so excited about this. So we'll get a few of these. On here. How many do you reckon? Do you want just three? Keep it simple. second just stay right there